morning, everyone. Thank you for being here on this very cold, blustery November day in Lubbock, Texas. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. I'm glad that you are all able to join us here at the Silent Wings Museum to help us honor our veterans and remember the sacrifices of those who are not among us. It was 101 years ago today, November 11th, 1918, on which the armistice, or temporary cessation of hostilities, first went into effect. My name is Ron Milam. I'm a professor of military history at Texas Tech University and the executive director of the Institute for Peace and Conflict, which includes the Vietnam Center and Sam Johnson Archive. I also serve as a board member of the Silent Wings Museum Foundation for the City of Lubbock, and I am proud to join my veteran brothers and sisters here today. The staff of the Silent Wings Museum has asked that I be the master of ceremonies for today's activities. I would like to take a moment to recognize our City of Lubbock selected and administrative officials that are here with us today. Mayor Pro Tem Jeff Griffith, Councilman Steve Massengale, back here, and Assistant City Manager Brooke Witcher. Brooke, you are somewhere here. Thank you for being here today. At this time, Brother David Wilson of South Crest Baptist Church will deliver the invocation. Please stand. If I might, before I pray, I would like to be one to thank you, men and women, who have provided the freedoms that we enjoy for so long. We never take that for granted. I, for one, don't take it for granted. I want to thank you for all that you've done and the families who sacrificed. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, you understand what sacrifice is because you sacrificed your own son for our freedom. And I thank you, Lord, for the men and women in this room who represent so many ways of sacrifice by giving their life, portion of their life. Their families have been separated from them at times. And no one knows fully all of the sacrifice that was given at that time. But thank you that we live in a country that is free because of the service of these men and women. May we never take that for granted. May we always be a grateful nation. And Lord, we look to you for continued freedom and guidance. And may we always have people who will treasure that freedom. But thank you so much for the men and women represented here. Who Some are not here. Some gave it all. But we ask that you would be with their families, that you would remind them of how much we thank them for all that they have done. We ask your blessings on this time together and ask you to be present here. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Will the Lubbock High School Junior ROTC Color Guard please present the colors. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Thank you. Please be seated. What we celebrate today as Veterans Day has its roots in World War I, known at the time as the Great War. It officially ended when the Treaty of Versailles was signed on June 28, 1919, in the Palace of Versailles outside of Paris, France. However, fighting had ceased seven months earlier when an armistice or temporary cessation of hostilities between the Allied nations and Germany went into effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. For that reason, November 11th, 1918, is generally regarded as the end of the war to end all wars. On May 13th, 1938, Congress approved that the 11th of November in each year be a legal holiday a day to be dedicated to the cause of world peace and that it thereafter be celebrated and known as Armistice Day. It was primarily a day set aside to honor veterans of World War I. But in 1954, after World War II had required the greatest mobilization of soldiers, sailors, and Marines in the nation's history, and after American forces had fought in Korea, the 83rd Congress, at the urging of the Veterans Service Organizations, amended the Act of 1938 by striking out the word armistice and inserting in its place the word veterans. With the approval of this legislation on June 1, 1954, November 11th became a day to honor American veterans of all wars. At this time, I would like to ask all the veterans in attendance here today to please stand and be recognized. Thank you. I also know, as a veteran, that it's not just the veterans who serve, but it's those families of veterans who so often wait to hear the word about their service. So I would like at this time for all families of veterans to please stand and be recognized. Thank you. I would like to introduce Mayor Pro Tem Jeff Griffith to read a 2019 Veterans Day proclamation. First, let me just say uh, about Jeff Griffith. He was elected to the Lubbock City Council as the District 3 representative in June of 2014. He is a Lubbock native and graduate of Monterey High School. Jeff is a member of the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the South Plains Association of Government's Board of Directors. He supports the local Boys and Girls Club and is proud to have been elected to their Alumni Hall of Fame. Jeff is the owner of Brand Source Radio Lab and has been involved in this business for over 27 years. He has served on the Brand Source National Board of Directors, a $14 billion operation, and has also served two terms as Brand Source Southwest Regional President. Mayor Pro Tem Griffith is honored to serve the residents of District 3 and the citizens of Lubbock. Please come forward. Good morning. I've been honored to be able to do this a few times as a member of your city council. I've always read the presidential proclamation. This year, I'm going to change it a little bit because of we want to add a local flavor, just as we saw these great, great youth from Lubbock High School. 
This proclamation is a very heartfelt proclamation from the city of Lubbock. Whereas on Veterans Day, America pauses to honor every service member who has served the United States and worn our nation's uniform. And whereas Americans veterans have served with distinction, courage, self-sacrifice and devotion to our nation and to one another under the most demanding circumstances and in the most dangerous places on our planet. And whereas on this day, we express our appreciation and acknowledge the debt of gratitude that we owe the men and women of the armed forces who, pre who preserve our freedom and who represent our American ideals, both at home and abroad. And whereas the United States and our city are blessed to have patriotic citizens, many of whom served in our country's military and who earned and deserve the thanks and fullest support of a grateful nation and a grateful city. And whereas it is fitting on Veterans Day for our nation and for Lubbock to pause and remember those who have served, those who were wounded, those who are missing in action, and those who made the ultimate sacrifice of veterans of America's military. Now, therefore, we, the mayor and the city council of the great city of Lubbock, do hereby proclaim today, November 11, 2019, as Veterans Day, in Lubbock and express the respect of our nation and all Lubbock's residents to all veterans and all active members for your role in furthering the cause of peace and freedom in our nation and around the world. Dated this 11th day of November, signed by the mayor and all the members of our city council. Thank you all very much. This is a great day. Thank you for coming out on this cold day. It's an honor to be here again and hope you have a great Veterans Day. Thank you. At this time, would you please stand for the playing of Taps by Mr. Jerry Serrano. I'm pleased today to introduce our special speaker, Mr. Jack Woodville London. Mr. London is originally from Groom, Texas, and his World War II historical fiction trilogy is set in a fictional town in the Texas Panhandle. A successful author of many books, he is also a lawyer, has written many technical legal articles, and was editor of the University of Texas International Law Journal. He is director of writing education for the Military Writers Society of America and studied the craft of fiction at the Academy of Fiction, St. Cyr, France, and Oxford University. Jack also teaches writing to veterans, many with PTS. He believes that everyone has a story, and his mission is to help these soldiers write theirs. His French Letters, World War II Trilogy, was listed in Kirkus Review's Best Books of the 2018 issue. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jack Woodville London. Thank you for coming here on the 100th anniversary 
of Veterans Day, originally Armistice Day. On this day last year, I was at the American Military Cemetery for the Meurs Argonne in France, doing exactly then what I'm doing now, speaking to a group of people who really care about our country and want to honor the service of our veterans. My wife, Alice, who is here in the front row, and I went to France. Our purpose was to attend the memorial service, to speak, and as much as anything, to go and find the graves of as many people as our friends and family could help us find. And we located them and we put American flags, and in many cases, Texas flags, on those graves. It was our attempt to be there on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of the year 1918, 100 years later, to do honor on this very day. And now it is my great honor to be here with you today on the 101st anniversary of Armistice Day, on the 100th anniversary of Veterans Day. This day actually has, in my view, its origins not in 1918 or in the Great War, but in the Civil War. A woman that, whose name was Julia Ward Howe was standing on her porch when the 6th Wisconsin Infantry marched by on its way to Kentucky where it was going to be engaged in battle. And some men were singing John Brown's body goes lying in the grave. And the tune was well known, but she's the one who gave it the words. And these are words each of us knows. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. And within weeks, that song was put in the uh, Atlantic magazine and became the song of the battle hymn of the Republic and was known throughout both the North and the South for the remainder of the Civil War. What did not happen for the remainder of the Civil War was the utter reverence for the cause of armed conflict that killed so many people. <clears throat> by 1970, Julia, by 1870, Julia Ward Howe led what became a women's movement. And that movement is the true forerunner of our Armistice Day and our Veterans Day because they had never in history seen so many of their sons, their husbands, and their fathers march into a distant place to be slaughtered in the number of some 650,000 men and untold numbers of casualties and to die and be buried in places where none of them could ever again go. And it was their mission to not, as they said, allow men with their political views to round up our men in numbers and kill them for no particularly good reason. I don't think any of us would agree that the Civil War was fought for no particularly good reason or that men who make political decisions do so lightly. But it was in that moment that the women of America said, we will honor our men when they are called off to battle. No one dreamed they would be called off to battle in a foreign land, though, as happened in 1917. And certainly no one dreamed they would be called off in such huge numbers to fight in France. The United States had never before engaged in a war across the ocean. They'd been into Mexico. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, according to him, alone won the war in Cuba. Uh, we had a very lightly contested war against Spain in the Philippines. But no one anticipated that an army of 110,000 Americans in 1917, most of whom were chasing Pancho Villa into Mexico, would grow to become an army of 5 million, of whom some 4 million wound up in France. Yet in a period of less than a year and a half, American men and women in unprecedented numbers not only went overseas, but went overseas and were killed in numbers that you cannot imagine. We lost 117,000 men and women, either to death by combat or 
to the Spanish flu, almost all of them, listen to this, almost all of them between June 1918 and November 1918. In three battles, however, the United States put its name on the world stage as a power that would make the difference in the wars of nations. The second division, mostly Marines, fought at a place called Belleau Wood and utterly stopped the German advance on Paris only 50 miles away from that city. Had Germany broken through, that war would have turned out differently. A month later, at Chateau Thierry, young men, including men from Lubbock and these surrounding towns, gave their lives to stop a second German advance on the Marne River that would have taken them to Paris. But it was at the Battle of saint miel and the Meurs Argonne in September, October, and November that the headlines every day brought enormous numbers of casualties to a public that was not geared up for it. The Meuse-Argonne Offensive was the largest battle in American history. Some 1.2 million American soldiers went into battle against Germany in an area against 60 German divisions not much larger than Lubbock County. When that happens, people get killed, and a lot of them did. 27,000 American boys died in one month. 54,000 died in six weeks. But of particular interest to those of us in this room, most of the boys from Texas wound up in one of two particular divisions, the 36th Division, who lost 300 men in one hour on October 8th. And the 90th Division, mostly in the 359th and the 360th, that lost over 4,000 men in six weeks, all in the same tiny area of the news are gun forced up against the German border. These were numbers that nobody was prepared for. Everyone in the United States knew a boy who was in line in that battle. Every household in the United States lost a boy either to death or disease during that battle. Unfortunately, those boys were buried where they fell, and many times their graves were shared with the German soldiers they were fighting against. And they stayed there for about three years while enough men could be assembled to create graves groups to go to France and to create cemeteries. And they created six cemeteries that are in France today, given by the French people as American sovereign soil, the largest of which is the Meuse Argonne Cemetery the cemetery that Alice and I went to last year. It was the largest battle, the largest number of deaths, and unfortunately it is the largest cemetery that the United States has in Europe and anywhere in the world apart from the cemetery in the Philippines. 48,000 of our men are still buried in France, most in that cemetery or in the Chateau Thierry Cemetery called the Wazane, or in the Belleau Wood Cemetery called the Bellow Wood Cemetery. And to get an idea of what the hardship was that these men and women faced, so many artillery shells were fired during the last year of battle that no plant of any kind could grow there for over 11 years. If you go there today, you will see barren spots, in part because of the poison gas, and in part because the uh, shells are still lodged in the ground and it's just too dangerous to run a tractor through there. One year afterward, on this day, a hundred years ago, President Wilson proclaimed the armistice and he used these words. <clears throat> to those of us in America, the reflections of armistice day will be filled with solemn pride in the heroism of those who died in this country's service and with gratitude for the victory both because of the thing from which it has freed us and because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the councils of the nations. And originally this celebration included parades, public meetings, and a two-minute suspension of business at 11 in the morning. I'd like to talk a minute about the men from this area. My first comment is that there are 36 graves filled with men from Lubbock, 
and from the surrounding counties and the villages and towns around here. Places like Post, Slayton, Brownfield, Floyd Data, Crosbyton, and Rawls. These were all men, 100% of them, who died within that period from July 1st to November the, the uh, 11th. Uh, some of them are buried in France to this day. And in 1930 or 1931, some 12 women from this area, uh, Etta Brand and Hattie Brown from Plainview, Maddie Miller from Floyd Data, Mrs. Evans from Ropesville, Miss Abernathy, Miss Moore from Lubbock, Miss Dobson from Slayton, two ladies from Rawls, Fannie Lee Byerly and Effie Cadenhead, a woman named Addie Jones from O'Donnell, and a woman named Lou Gary from Post. Those women met each other. They didn't come to downtown Lubbock to meet. They wound up meeting each other on ships. These women were part of the first Gold Star Mothers. My service, the Army Quartermaster Corps, arranged in 1930 through 1933 to invite the women who, were, who lost their husbands, their sons, or their fathers, and who are buried in France, invited them to go at America's expense to these foreign fields to visit their sons in their graves and to see their cemeteries and to give them one chance to have a final farewell. These 12 women and some 8,000 others were given train tickets to New York, hotel rooms, and shipboard service all the way to France, often in ships on which their own sons had sailed to France in 1917 and in 1918. These women were met in France, taken to Paris, and put up in hotels, and taken to their cemeteries one by one to stay as long as they wished to stay with their sons. By that time, if you'll think about the ages involved, were, were some 15 years after the war and the boys who died were in their mid-20s, that means the boys would have been in their 40s and most of these women would have been in their 60s. And it was a darn hard trip to go from Rawls or Crosbyton or Lubbock to France to do what Julia Ward Howe in 1862 and in 1870 said was such a cruelty of war that you could not say goodbye. One woman died of a heart attack at her son's grave. Other women cared for her and others who became sick and took them back to Paris and stayed with them in hotels until it was time for the return trip. But it was that outpouring on behalf of you who support the veterans that made us appreciate that the veterans alone are not the only ones who suffer. The other aspect of that period that troubles me greatly was even so, even though the president had declined, declared that Armistice Day was to honor those who died. It was those who were living who needed some help. World War I gave us names that these men brought home with them. Shell shock, which we now know as PTSD or PTS. Poison gas, barbed wire, machine guns, trench foot, plastic surgery. The men who came back brought their scars with them on the outside on the inside or both. And by the 1930s, many of them simply could not find and keep a job during the Great Depression. These veterans banded together and asked for the bonuses that they had been promised to be accelerated. And they went to Washington, D.C. and asked for a bonus to be paid for their service. They had been promised this bonus as part of enlisting or as serving in France but the promise was that it would be paid in 25 years, so it really wasn't due. But these men were starving. They went to Washington and asked for it. Their shanty camp was overrun by tanks. Machine guns were turned on them. And men who had saved officers' lives in 1918 were told, I never want to hear your name again. Get out of here. That's not how we honor our veterans. It was a horrific political mistake. President Hoover told the officers involved, don't do this, they did. He lost his election, and of course, President Roosevelt 
won the election. But in the meantime, we cared then and we care now for the soldiers who brought these things back and for the men and the women. And I'd like to ask you just to bear with me a moment as I tell you about just a few of these 36 men. One of them is a boy whose name is Robert Brahon. He grew up in Hale County as a farmer. One of his best friends was a boy named Walter Alexander. And these two boys would go out and play clod ball as little nine and 10 year old kids. I'll bet there are those of us in the room who played clod ball. We didn't have a football or a baseball, but we had clods. <clears throat> they uh, wound up being in two different directions. Alexander wound up being a foot soldier. Uh, Robert Brahan, his father was a merchant. He became a second lieutenant. He was killed on the very first day of the Mirzar gun battle, 30 yards, 30 miles from where he is buried to this day. His mother was the very first Gold Star mother to go to France from this region. There's a boy named Walter Byerly. His father was a cart cotton merchant. They lived in Crosbyton. He was killed in the largest loss of life in a single period at that battle I told you about on, set, on October the 8th, the battle in front of Saint Etienne, where American men had over 300 men killed in just an hour. His mother went to visit him. There was a boy named George Fitzgerald. George grew up uh, in uh, Crosbyton. He was killed on August the 1st in front of Chateau Thierry. His body was brought home, and it, he's buried out there now in the Petersburg Cemetery. George Fitzgerald grew up here in, uh, here in Lubbock. He's buried in the Hale County Cemetery. He was killed on August the 1st in front of Chateau Thierry as a corporal in the 3rd Infantry Regiment. He's home now. And finally, Joe Barton from Hale County. He lived next door to a girl named Donna West. He dated a girl named Beulah Ray. He wound up in that 90th Infantry Division and was killed one week before the end of the war. He's home today. But then we had boys like Luther Warren who grew up over in Dickens. <clears throat> On his draft card, he listed that he was single. He was a day laborer, which meant he was a cowboy. And he was the only entry of his family in the 1910 census <clears throat> because he was also an orphan. He's in France today because he had no one to bring him home. He was a single man, a solitary man, a hero and a soldier, and has no one to go and visit him, and Alice and I did. And I'm very, I'm very humbled by the men and the women who make a sacrifice of that sort. The 1930s, our view of veterans changed radically. We had the mobilization of the largest military force in the Western world for World War II. Even so, we fought in segregated units. There were magnificent black units who fought in Italy. There were magnificent Japanese units who fought in Italy. There were units entirely comprised of Indians who were code talkers who served throughout the Pacific. But we still segregated on account of race. And somewhere along the way, someone said, this is nuts. These men and these women died just as hard. Their families love them as much. They've served us as honorably. And President Truman ended segregation in 1947. The GI Bill brought many people, including some of us in this room, an opportunity to go to college financially that otherwise we might not have had. Veterans have benefited enormously. And that, of course, brings us to the Armistice Day. Many of us grew up buying poppies at school for five cents on Armistice Day and lost it in 1954 when it became Veterans Day. And I've wondered about that many, many times. And I've decided that it was right. Because every one of us who's joins the service, signs a blank check with our lives. Most of us, that check is never cashed. But all of us 
know that it is there and it may be handed in at any time. You patiently watched this up on the screen as we've spoken. Alice has composed a film of our service in France last year. If it works, I'd like to play that for you now and I would ask that you pay attention. This is a memorialization of our participation in the 100th anniversary of Armistice at the Moose Argonne Cemetery and you will see where our heroes from that war are laid to rest. I don't want to diminish any stories by singling out one, but I'd like to single out one that you may have seen, Simon Gonzalez. It said that he died for freedoms in Europe that he, as a Mexican-American, did not enjoy at home. I was introduced earlier to someone who said, I'd like you to meet the woman who made it possible for you to be here. <laughs> and I, I'm very 
gratified that I was able to meet her, but it wasn't just her who made me possible to come here. It was Simon Gonzalez and Ben Lester. It was Orville Knopf who spoke German at home and killed Germans in France. It was Thomas Graves. It was all of you. It was all of us. It was a tremendous honor to be there last year. It's a tremendous honor to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jack, for those wonderful words, inspiring words. I also want to recognize that we had many veterans uh, come in uh, within the last 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you so much for all of you being here today. This concludes our, uh, our uh, program for today. I just want to say that uh, this special Veterans Day, we honor all those men and women who have served their nation no matter what, where they served, when they served, or what they did while they were serving. It's a very special day for all of us. We're going to have a book signing. Um, Jack will be signing books later today. We want you to uh, stay around and visit some of our special exhibits that we have here at the Silent Wings Museum. Thank you so much for being here today. <laughs>